So welcome everybody uh, to our program tonight. Biblio Commons has done a series of online programs this summer to help highlight ways that libraries and librarians and by turn, you know, writers and authors and illustrators can reach out to their readers who are part of a broader online community. So in libraries, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to get patrons to come into the library and really through programming experience our collections and our resources. And one of the things that we're working on this summer is to help libraries see the possibilities for doing that in a purely online environment. That we have a lot of patrons who are really interested in or who are already very heavy users of the library, but they do that mainly in a remote or a virtual way. And so tonight we are very excited to have a great program that's really taking advantage of the visual opportunities that we have by doing a remote program. So I'm here with Mara Rockliffe and Eliza Wheeler, who are the author and the illustrator, respectively, of The Grudge Keeper, published by Peachtree. And they're going to be uh, interviewed, I would say, by Betsy Bird, who is a, staff, a staffer at the New York Public Library. So just to get started, I'm going to make the introductions. Um, I'm controlling the kind of the back end. So if you have questions at any time, please feel free um, to put them in the chat and I'll monitor that. If there's an opportunity while the presentation is going on to put the question in, I'll okay. certainly do that. If not, we have time at the end for questions and answers. And so we're gonna take a, a nice look tonight at what the process is like for an author and an illustrator to collaborate on a picture book, um, looking at The Grudge Keeper. So again, uh, we're joined by Mara Rockliffe, who is our author. So Mara is the award-winning author of Mr. And, and Mama, me and Mama, I'm sorry, and Big John, and My Heart Will Not Sit Down, as well as many other children's books, including the Milo and Jazz Mysteries series, which was published under the pen name Lewis B. Montgomery. So Mara lives in eastern Pennsylvania with her family and a small, yappy pet peeve. Maybe your pet peeve will be joining us later, Mara. I do hope not. <laughs> And Eliza, our illustrator, grew up in Wisconsin in a family of teachers, musicians, and artists, and re received a degree in art and design from the University of Wisconsin Stout. She also wrote and illustrated the New York Times bestseller, Miss Maple's Seeds. She lives in Los Angeles. So welcome, Eliza. Thank you. And as I mentioned, uh, we are going to be moderated by Betsy Bird. So many of us know her from her work with the New York Public Library in their book ops, which is the combined technical services department for New York Public and Brooklyn Public. Or we know her through her work with School Library Journal as part of the work she does under uh, Fuse 8 or in her work as an author in her own right. So welcome, Betsy, and thank you for being our moderator. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, so should we just dive on in? Let's do it. Okay, well, for those of you who are not familiar yet uh, with The Grudge Keeper, uh, I pity you, because this is a beautiful book. Um, I'm actually going to quote a bit from a review that I did for it, just to sort of give you a sense. Um, this is something that I wrote about it uh, about a month ago. That folk tales, and it is, it is a very folk tale y feel, folk tales will always have a place in the realm of children's literature. They remain the number one most efficient way to dole out lessons to the kiddies without sounding like you're trying to teach them something. But new folk tales are always welcome, and that's precisely what The Grudge Keeper really is. It's timely in its telling, and Rockcliffe and Wheeler together manage to make a book that feels simultaneously fresh and classic all in one go. It's beautifully rendered and written. There's nothing begrudging in my praise of this work. If you want something that could be read by countless generations of kids thanks to its classic feel, this little title has your number. And I would stand by that. It is absolutely lovely. So let's just dive right in. Mara, where did you get the idea of this book uh, in the first place? Well, it actually just kind of popped into my head, I guess. Um, I think I must have heard somebody use the phrase keeping a grudge or a grudge keeper. And I just thought, well, wouldn't it be funny if that was a job title, like a zookeeper or a beekeeper? Um, and then nobody would ever have to keep a grudge because, like, the grudge keeper would keep it for them. So, so I guess it just started as sort of silly wordplay, and um, and I just went on that way. Um, I figured any place that had a grudge keeper would also be a place where, like, if if somebody got your goat, then there was really a goat. Um, or if you had a bone to pick, you'd toss the bone to a pet peeve. Um, and the funny thing was, after it came out, um, a lot of reviews said. Kind of like what you just said about um, 
about teaching kids something um, without them noticing, you know, and um, and that actually it shouldn't have, but it came as a total surprise to me, um, and it really never crossed my mind that I was teaching anyone a lesson with the story. I was just kind of having some, some fun. Well, Marty Sendak always said that he never wrote for children. They they just happened to end up being the audience that he wrote for. So. I think that's in, in some ways it's the best way to write is simply you're writing a great story and uh, kids happen to get something out of it that's fantastic but it doesn't always have to be the goal. Well I feel ashamed when you know people say oh this teaches such a good lesson about how we should be because I am a world champion grudge keeper. You know, like, I mean any kid who reads this book I probably have grudges that are older than those kids. So. <laughs> I'm in no position to be teaching lessons, but, but but it was a good reminder for me. Have you done any school visits with this book? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have kids asking about your grudges specifically? <laughs> no. Um, good. Uh, <laughs> they, um, but they like sharing their pet peeves when, once they find out what a pet peeve is. Oh, I bet. I bet. Probably involves their pets in some way. Um, <laughs> Usually siblings. Siblings are yeah, <laughs> That's a different book. So, Eliza, let's let's get your input on this as well. Um, now, how many picture books have you done that were written by other authors? Um, before The Grudge Keeper, I had only done one other book that was written by another author, and that was an indie publisher, um, Little Pickle Press, a book called What Does It Mean to Be Present? And then and then my sort of debut book, which was written by me, Miss um, Mabel Seeds, was my second book. So, so this being my third, um, it, it was really great to get Mara's text because it's so great to get that idea just sort of fully formed. And uh, you know, I, I could have never like it's one of those stories I never could have written, but. Um, you know, when I saw it, I was like, oh, I wish I could write this, you know, and I always know that's such a good sign that it's a, it's a good match. Did you instantly, when you, when you got it and you, and you read through the text, did you instantly know what the characters were going to look like? I, I kind of, I mean, I, I think that I got the general idea of the, the, the sort of general outline of the vision, you know, was in my head, and I know that a, a story is right for me when I'm reading the manuscript, and I can sort of see it all unfolding in my imagination, um, and uh, and yeah, so so um, let's see, where was I? Um, yeah, so reading it, it first sort of conjured up the style, but I also look at a lot of inspiration, and I looked at a, a lot of um, like golden age artists like Arthur Rackham, and um, one of my favorite contemporary illustrators is Lisbeth Werger, um, who's who's Austrian, and she's got such a great folktale look. So it's it always helps to sort of like gather all of this inspiration before I even start sketching. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then and then it's sort of thinking about the characters next. And um, and I love that in your review you said you know it's a, it's like feels like a classic folktale, but it also feels fresh because I think that was my biggest goal with the characters to, was to sort of give them this classic folktale feeling, but do something a little bit new with them too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's it's exciting to hear that that. <laughs> Was a success. <laughs> well, I think you know, I, we, we may have a slide of this, but I think we have a slide of, a, of all the, the characters in a row as you were sort of getting the sketches together. We do. But, do you uh, want me to go forward to it? Yeah, can you go forward just a little bit? It's uh, it's not the next one. Keep this going. one. It's a, uh, yes, it's this one. I just love, I love looking at these uh, these characters and just their shapes, just the the different shapes of each character. They're fantastic, and of course, um, what I like most about this. Is that it shows the top-hatted goat, who is personally <laughs> my favorite 
character, I honestly, if you guys wanted to write a book just about the top-hatted goat, <laughs> that would make me very happy. Uh, so Mara will have to get on that. <laughs> I'll just throw that out there. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, yeah. it's funny, the, the top-hatted goat, it, like, it came that way in my mind, and it, and it stayed, he, he stayed that way, you know? It's, it's, I don't know where that came from, it just sort of, he came that way, like... Yeah. He came in the box that way, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to say he's the first top-hatted goat I've seen, but he's the best top-hatted goat. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, let's, let's go back to you, Mara. Let's talk a little bit about your process. When you sit down to write a picture book, how many drafts do you tend to do uh, of the text? Um, well, with, uh, with The Brush Keeper, I think I wrote five drafts before Peachtree bought it. Um, and after that, I, I didn't really count. Um, just, you know, every stage of proof that came in, we would kind of tinker with it and make more changes. Um, I think we've got some, five... some slides that will show at some point of that, too. Well, with the initial, like, five drafts that you did yourself, did you have other people that you knew read it, or these were five drafts that you yourself went through and said, okay, no, let's change this, and then you went through them? Like, what was, what was the process? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so, the thing about this book um, is that it took seven years to come out. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I can't remember. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. um, exactly. I only, I only remember that there are five drafts because I, I went and looked at the folder today. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, frequently I'll, I might run it by, you know, I have a few critique partners that I'll, that I'll run things by. Um, Sometimes I'll show things to my agent first, and she'll have suggestions. Um, this this book got turned down by eighteen or twenty publishers, so I probably Ooh, did wow. some of those drafts after, you know, getting thing, you know, getting getting rejections, and and then thinking, well, how could I improve on it? Um, I wish I could remember more specifically. I'm sorry. Well, now uh, now that's interesting to hear that it was rejected because you know the. The common wisdom right now amongst librarians is that back in the day we had tons of folk tales to draw from and it was wonderful and that these days getting a folk tale published is a major event. If one comes out, the publisher makes a huge deal about it. They're like, look, it's a folk tale um, mm. because they're, not, they're so rare at this point in time. So do you think it was that that sort of made people not want to go for it because they just were like, ah, oh, nobody buys folk tales anymore, even yeah. though that is blatantly untrue. <laughs> I didn't hear that, so I, I don't know if that was an issue, but um, I think the two things that I heard, one was um, that, they, well, three things. I guess I guess one was that they thought kind of the topic just wouldn't resonate with children of picture book age mm -hmm. um, and maybe the vocabulary. Um, and it's true that it's, you know, I do tend to write picture books on the higher end. Um, you know, I don't write great story time books for two-year-olds um, by and large. Uh, but... Um, but the other thing that I thought was really funny was that um, some people said they just could not picture how those grudges would look. Really? And, um, Eliza had no trouble with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I had pictured sort of like little scraps of paper, um, and I love Eliza's scrolls. I mean, that's even better. But I, I just thought it was funny that um, they just thought it would be impossible to illustrate. <laughs> so Eliza has done the impossible. Um, it's it's f funny you mentioning that because it, it's sort of uh, it's a good segue. Like we're looking at the image right now of of Cornelius's um, cottage, just filled with with you know the scrolls, all the grudges, and uh, it it's funny. Um, you know my my initial response when I read the book was like, oh man, this is so perfect. I love, you know, folk tales, fairy tales. I knew it was right up my alley. But there were things about the story that kind of scared me. <laughs> and one was I saw this particular spread in my head and I was worried that I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, I was kind of like, how am I going to draw all of those all of that paper, you know. <laughs> you can do like a Peter Cease, like every single scroll, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and it, it it was it was so it's you know I think for me it's always a good 
part of, you know, that fear is sort of a good thing because I know it's pushing me out of my comfort zone. And so that is sort of an exciting adrenaline <laughs> kind of fear. But um, with this with this particular image, I really wanted to, like, fill the place up and make it feel like there were thousands of scrolls. Um, you know, but then the question is, how do, how do you, you know, how do you sort of depict thousands? And you can see mounds where you don't even see the details. It kind of disappears into just a big clump. And, um, and it's nice. My husband is also an artist and he, he like was always looking behind my shoulder and I'm like, is this enough? And he's like, no, 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 more. Pile them on more, you know? So it was kind of nice to have that uh, second eye making sure I was exaggerating. And what would you say sort of changed in your drafts of, in, and the art over time? Um, the... There was, you know, there weren't a lot of huge changes. We started with sort of these little storyboard images. Oh, I think um, we have a slide of that. Oh, yeah. Me. Yeah, we might have an image of the storyboards. Yeah. Um, Keep going. Yeah, there's my sketch table. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, right here? No, nope. Keep going. There we go. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, we'll so... Um, you kind of start with with these little thumbnail sketches, um, and then they s turn into these storyboards. And I work back and forth with the art director at Peachtree to, um, you know, see if the pacing is right. And um, let's see, can can we move one more forward? Nope. I think it was back actually. This oh, one. back. One more back. One more. There we go. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, and like some of the the images are pretty close. Um, if you look at them, you know they're rough. They're they're really tiny, a couple inches, maybe like two inches wide and an inch tall. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was kind of a good way to just start and then work from there. I think the biggest change was in that wedding scene that we were just looking at, which was, you know, they had me swap, um, Peachtree had me swap the wedding couple, and I think that actually caused a change in the text for Mara. What do you yeah, mean? that's what, I didn't realize they asked you to swap the... Yeah, yeah, in my, I, it's, yeah, it's too bad. I guess in the storyboards you don't see the wedding scene, but they they were originally swapped so that um, Lily Bell's on the left and Big Otto's on the right. And there was there was some. I of course I can't remember exactly why, but um, can we move up the slide and see? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Is it um, forward? You think? That's there we go. There we go. There it is. Um, yeah, and it was sort of to match the order of the text better. Um, because in the text you see Big Auto mentioned first, so then you sort of are looking from left to right, you know. So in the text, Elvira and Minnie Fletcher are mentioned, and the goat, um, and so they're on the left, and so you're sort of working from left to right visually with the text. And so I think that was the, the original swap that we made. Um, but yeah, then it, it ended up causing that change in the text that, that Mara has mentioned. Well, and you can see where the gutter is going to fall right in the center here. It's right between the couple. So you right, know, Otto's right. one on one page and she'd be on another page. I'm always very interested in, in yeah, in how something is read. I've, I've seen people talk about how they had a character running right to left and they had to change that because people didn't like the idea of something going back into the book. Um, right. Forward, so... Very interesting. Okay, um, so Mara, let's let's go. Let's talk about the editing process. We sort of alluded to it a little bit earlier, um, we, and we have some slides here that, that show your your back and forth with your editor. Uh, yes, exactly, it was something like that. Um, and what I what I love about them is is it shows that no matter how sparse the text in a book, there is always a lot of editing to be done. Oh, um, yeah. Would you say that picture books are Harder to write than novels, or I mean, I've heard people actually say that that they're they're actually more difficult in some ways, or do you just think they're you know they're probably on par with one another? Well, I've heard people say that too. Um, I guess I think it's sort of like running a sprint versus running a marathon. Um, 
And I say that from a place of complete ignorance because I never run at all. I mean, like, <laughs> if, you, if you ever see me running, just look behind me for the guy wielding the axe because that's not going to happen. But, but you know, so so pulling that wonderful um, comparison completely, you know, out of nowhere. Um, I, I would say that word for word, writing a picture book is harder. I mean, like if you write an 800 word picture book, that's going to take more effort than writing any 800 words out of a longer book. Um, but I think it would be ridiculous to say that writing a picture book takes more effort than a whole novel. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's two reasons that you hear people saying that. And one is that you sort of have to have a feeling for the rhythm and the pacing of a picture book. And, you know, just because you're good at writing novels, that skill doesn't necessarily transfer. Um, you know, and of course the reverse is also true. Um, but I think the main reason that you hear writers make that statement um, is just kind of that people tend to assume that picture books take no effort or skill at all. Um, you know, like, oh, it's short and it's simple, and I'll just knock one off while the babies hit me back, you know. Um, and, and some people who write picture books can get maybe a tiny bit defensive, and uh, and that's where you hear, you know, oh, it's harder than writing a novel. Um, but, yeah, I would say only just, you know, word for word, yes, but, but it's not like it would be easier to write War and Peace than a picture book. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now, this was your first... Um your first book with Peachtree. Now, mm -hmm. uh, so you had a new editor with this one. I, I, you don't happen to recall how many editors you've worked with over the years, do you? Oh, well, let's see. Kendall at Cotton Mifflin, three for King Press, um, uh, well, Peachtree and Scholastic and Random Map. It had a eight, ten, just for trade books. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a lot of editors. So, um, what was and I it? hardly ever see them, you know, like in person. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't actually go to their offices and work. You do it all. You and they it. all have names that start with J or K, pretty much. <laughs> so it's very easy to get them mixed up. Yes, I bet. I remember one time uh, someone I knew was at a conference and said, oh, I met so-and-so. And I was like, who's that? That sounds really familiar. And he's like, your editor? <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> Right, that would be movie. why that name sounded familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so this one was Kathy uh, Landwehr. She was your mm -hmm. editor on the computer. Um, what, what would she like to do? Is she listening? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, um, everything was great with Kathy. I, I really have never had an easier time working with an editor. Um, she's really easygoing. She's got a sense of humor, which makes it fun to work with her. Um, and she answers emails really promptly which is not what you'd call like a universal trait in publishing. <laughs> oh, that's um, nice. Yeah, no, yeah, she's great to work actually, with. Um, we've got a couple other uh, uh, images of, of your editing, actually, if we can move forward just a little bit here. Yeah, so that's, that's very interesting to me. It shows some of the, uh, some of the comments on the pages. Yeah, so the, okay, so the you're blue. to the comments with the pages that they... they uh, are talking about, which is cool. Yeah. It's to the blue on those pages would be Kathy, and then the black would be me. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I think there's one more after this, too. Let's see. Yeah, that was neat. And I like this, too, because... Uh, it's something... That, those were actually pop-up boxes, I think, with notes, but, but something funny happened to them. Yeah. When I when I look at the PDF, you have to click on the the um, the little box. That's why I circled them to get the comments to pop up. So you can see down in the corner. Oh, so you can actually make it. Oh. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't absolutely have noticed that otherwise. Thank you. Great. So Eliza, um, you know, looking at at some of your art here, is there a, a specific medium that you prefer to work in? Yeah, um, I, I work in I work with dip pens in India ink, so it's kind of that the old fashioned you know the way you think of pen and ink, um, uh, and um, and then watercolors for the color part, um, and yeah I, I that's kind of always my always my medium sort of my go to um, I really I've really sort of fallen in love with it. And so I, I can't, you know, at this stage in my life, I'm, I feel really sort of married to it. 
Um, but I, I know a lot of illustrators who switch around and use different mediums. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like I take each book, I have sort of a visual approach for each story, and so um, it's, it's kind of nice to have that the visual side of it is what's unique, um, but uh, the medium stays the same, and, and hopefully that makes for somewhat of a consistent voice in my art from book to book. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Um, now, one thing that I, I don't think people always realize in these cases, they, they probably, you know, not everyone, but some people um, have sort of a vision in their head that when a, a picture book is being made, the author sits down with the illustrator and they talk it over and they, they, they shoot ideas and then they work together to get to a final product. And that, I'm not going to say that never happens. That certainly happens a little bit sometimes, um, but I would call it the exception rather than the rule. Um, in fact, did you guys, have you guys even, even met, uh, for, for example, aside from this? We, we met briefly <laughs> and it was a re really great story. Um, we, we met uh, after the, or wait, it was before The Grudge Keeper came out, but it was um, after we were finished with it, and um, Mara was receiving a Golden Kite Award at the SCBWI Summer Conference, and she gave me a shout out, you know, so <laughs> that was really cool. During, in the middle of her acceptance speech, um, we got to wave at each other across the room. Um, that was a really crowded. How many people were in there? Like, room? I mean, like maybe twelve hundred or more. <laughs> yeah. or so, like something like that. Uh, it was a really special moment. Yeah, and just, I mean, it was so brief, though. Um, we've never, you know, had the chance yet to sit down and have lunch or anything. And mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully, that opportunity will come up. Yeah. Um, well, can you talk a little bit about your collaboration? Um, did you have any back and forth, or was this all done entirely through your editor? Oh, as of you, I mean, oh, um, well, either either way, I, th I mean, I think probably our answers are the same in that we we didn't, you know, our paths didn't really cross throughout the process. Um, Mara worked with her editor, and then once they, you know, were were pretty, I think, finished with the text. That's when it came to me, and so um, so yeah, very very separate roles. Um, and not a whole lot of sort of direct collaboration. It was mostly with through the art director and the editor at Peachtree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are actually like two intermediaries between us, um, you know, because I would deal with the editor and Eliza would deal with the art director. And we're, Eliza and I are both on Twitter, so like sometimes I would yeah. see a sketch and, you know, go tweet like, oh my gosh, it looks so amazing. Um, but if I had any yeah. kind of request for a change or something that would go through the editor and the and the art director um, and you know if it if it actually made it to her in the end um, you know if they felt that something needed done there, there was very very little of that on this book anyway um, I can we can we go to that one um, from the wedding scene that is the sketch of the wedding scene there yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that must have been later already. But, um, yeah, I was really surprised to hear Eliza say that she had been asked to turn them around um, to that, uh, I guess from an earlier sketch, because in the text um, it was Big Otto knocking over the punch bowl, um, and, uh, you know, obviously it, it looks more like um, like Lily Bell is knocking over the punch bowl. And um, this was an, a good spread to... Um, to give us an example, because, um, like, I think Eliza in, a re in your first sketch, there, she wasn't actually giving the cake to the goat, and I think that was yeah, the, one, right. the one thing in the whole book that I asked for because um, I felt that, uh, you know, I said s something in the text with like, hmm, if we go to that next page, I think it has the text, um, and. Uh, yeah, you know, it says Elvira Boggs sneaks cake under the table until Minnie Fletcher says, you can't get my goat. And, and I figured that would be a tough joke for kids to get um, without the actual visual of her feeding the cake to the goat. Um, so I asked for that one. But then with Otto not being the one knocking over the punch bowl, that just didn't seem that important. That seemed like a really easy thing for me to change in the text. So I just rewrote the text to match the art. Um, so that spreads a good way of showing, you know, sometimes 
a writer might ask for a change, but also it's it can be easy to make your own changes and, and leave the art alone if the art's nice. Great. Um, you sort of already covered this, but did, was there any surprises that uh, that came along the way with for either of you working on this book? Um. Uh, Mara, uh, um, how about you, Mara? You go first. <laughs> well, I, I was just surprised it got published. <laughs> you know, there was, there was all those rejections, and then even after Peachtree bought it, it was just kind of one of those star-crossed things where just everything seemed to go wrong. Like my editor, my original editor left the company, and I think there were some hard years, and they weren't sure if uh, they wanted to go ahead with the story. and. And, but pretty much when, when Eliza came in and started making her sketches, I could see it was all going to have a happy ending. Have you, um, have you sold books before that did not get published? Actually sold them and had them not get published? Yeah, because I, no. I have heard of that happening before, so I wasn't sure if it happened either. I'm amazed, now that you mention it, that there's a misfortune that hasn't occurred to me in publishing. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd you know ridden all the rides, but um no, no I, I haven't actually. I don't think I've had that happen. Well done, well done. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and Eliza, did anything uh, surprise you along the way? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a hard question, uh, you know, because I feel like the the process it went really smoothly, and um, you know, it sort of just slowly unfolded you know, like gradually from those little storyboards into the final art. And I think by the by the time I'm working on the final art, um, everything's sort of been approved. And so you really hope for no surprises in general. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, for me, the, the biggest moment of surprise is just actually seeing it in print the, the year after. Um, it all comes out, you know. I hand I hand in the final artwork pretty much exactly a year before it's you know on shelf sale date, and it's it's actually I really like that buffer of time. I think some people it's you know hard to wait that long, and and I can't you know I can't imagine being the author and maybe Mara it was more excruciating to wait. Um, but for, for me, it's nice because, you know, I'm working on the final artwork and, you know, I go kind of cross-eyed and I get really close to it and it's sort of months of just looking at this, the same images and in, in my eyes during that time, I'm just sort of seeing all of the mistakes. And so it's kind of nice, like, by the time I'm done, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe, like, all the mistakes I've made. And, you know, I'm sort of stressing over what I, in my sort of crazy head, what I think is, like, the end of my career. And then, um, and this happened with Miss Maple Seeds, it's happened with everything. Um, but then that time goes by and it comes out a year later and it's like I get to look at it and I think the vision in my head is gone from like all of the mistakes that I had seen. They kind of disappear over that time and I get to like see it fresh and it's like, oh wow, like this this came out really well. I don't I don't know why I was so stressed out about this. <laughs> um, and so that's it's funny that the surprise is seeing my art <laughs> come out again later, but there is something surprising about that. That's great. Um, and now I think we're, uh, we're about coming to the end of our time, so I'm going to ask the question that absolutely everybody detests. Um, what are you guys either working on now or having come out soon? Well, I guess I should, because <laughs> my picture's there, but um, I, uh, this, this one, Chick Chak Shabbat, um, is coming out from Candlelight next month. Um, it's kind of a lighthearted, contemporary, multicultural story um, about this young woman who um, she always makes her Bubby's recipe every week and has her neighbors over to lunch. Um, and then one Saturday something goes wrong and, and all the neighbors kind of pitch in to save the day. Um, she, if you don't know the expression chick chuck, um, it's kind of like the Hebrew version of when Mary Poppins goes around saying, spit spot. <laughs> um, like it means quickly or whatever. And um, when I was young there used to be this fast food chain I think in Israel called Chick Chuck Chicken. Um, so this is Chick Chak Shabbat. That's great. How about you, Eliza? 
Oh, 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 you have to tell about the one you're doing with Pat. Yes, yes. <laughs> so this is um this is a picture book that I'll have coming out in I think April or May. I think maybe May um, 2015. And um, yeah, uh, Pat Zeitlow Miller um, is the author, and it's with Little Brown Books. Um, and it, it's sort of a it's it's a great um, uh, sort of meandering text of you know leaving leaving the house and all the wonderful things you'll see in the world um, and so you kind of follow this little bunny and as he meets up with other animal friends um, you get to follow along um, and so yeah that's that's coming out next spring oh well yeah Great. all right well thank you so much you guys for for speaking with us today Oh, thank you so much, Betsy, for uh, moderating us. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. yeah. Lovely getting a chance to talk to you and getting to see sort of a glimpse into your process. I agree, and thank you to all of you for uh, participating. Make sure you look uh, a little bit, um, Eliza and Mara, at the comments that people chatted in. Um, so definitely a lot of appreciation of being able to see uh, the what's behind the scenes to putting a book together and the way that the editing process worked, both for the art and the text. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, Mara and Eliza, I don't know if you have a little bit of time and you want to see if anybody has questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do for those of you who are in the audience is I'm going to unmute everybody. So if you have a happy dog or a clicky clacky type, uh, you know, keyboard in the background, just be aware that we'll all be able to hear it. Um, and if you have a question, you can just introduce yourself, uh, use your first name and let us know what your question is. So I'm going to unmute everybody. Well, Stephanie, you were asking about the pet peeve, and I was, I was afraid you might have heard that barking just a few minutes ago. I, I love when there are other attendees at webinars, personally. <laughs> so, uh, with anybody out in the audience, do you have a question for uh, Mara or Eliza? If you've muted yourself, you will have to unmute yourself. Or you can always type in a question or something. So I, I actually have one. Um, so when I was, you guys had done a great blog post about the working together. Um, and so when I kind of type up, uh, release the recording for this, I'll put a link to that blog post too that was done on Peachtree's blog. And you talked about collaborating together. And I think it was there, Mara, that you said that there's a little surprise, um, I think underneath the flaps. I think that's where you were talking about it. Uh -huh. um, and I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that so that people who are not like me and have the book in my hand, um, what they should maybe uh, go and look for. Oh, well, Eliza. Could, um... Or Eliza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, I think what, what, uh, what Mars talking about or had mentioned is um, the end papers, which is um, sort of before the story begins, it's the end papers sort of hold the jacket to the interior pages. Um, and Peach, it was actually Peachtree that, that did the end paper design. And so if you lift up the cover flap, I'm doing a horrible job of describing this, but um, you'll see underneath uh, there's the goat and the cat are sort of hidden under the flap. Um, in a very clever way. I also love that on the back, they're kind of giving each other a little hug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then um, Kathy uh, put a question in via chat. And um, I know Nikki from Peachtree, I think you're on the line. Um, so this might be a question actually that all three of you could kind of participate in. Um, her question is, how is the physical size of a picture book determined? Do different publishers have preferred shapes or sizes? Uh, well, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my name is Nikki. I'm from Peachtree. Um, and uh, I think that it really just depends on, um, from what I understand, um, depends on, you know, what best fits the book, what best represents the um, the, what we're trying to, you know, get across. So, like, um, if it's a smaller book, so maybe it's a poetry book, it might be a smaller format um, because, you know, poetry is more um, 
you know condensed. It's a it's a smaller um, smaller text, and so then you know the pictures might lend themselves to be a little bit more compact. Um, we'll work something like the Grudge Keeper. Um, it's very um, you know kind of more of a sprawling story, um, so it was it was better uh, for a larger format. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, so again, Mara and um, and Eliza both mentioned that they're on Twitter. So say if anybody has other questions, it might be um, worth checking them out on Twitter and seeing there. Uh, Mara's is Mara Rockliffe, all one word, and Eliza is Wheeler Studio. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Betsy, for your wonderful questions. And thank you, Mara and Eliza, for creating a beautiful book. Thank you. Thanks for letting us chat about it here. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great night.